way, my name is Pastor Flynn, the lead pastor here at First Baptist Church. And as you can tell, joining me to share this morning is my wife, Brooke. Good morning, everybody. Um, we're just so glad we can see you. We can um, gather with other human beings um, and just worship together. Hasn't it been great being able to get back together? Um, even with, yeah, constraints and, and definitely with some things that are a little bit different, it's just beautiful to see some smiling faces. And um, we're excited to just sit down with you today. I want you to like, I love that song it says to breathe in and breathe out. We're going to do that this morning and we're going to just come and enter into a holy conversation this morning. We have been praying and talking over really the last several months. Um, what does our church need to hear? What do they need to be reminded of that is so true and constant in God's word? And out of those conversations, these conversations have come. And so we just want to sit here with you this morning and acknowledge um, all the weird things that have gone on, but all the things that have never changed. No pandemic can take all of our choices away. Um, because God is constant and He never changes. So we're going to um, start with just praying this morning, and then we're just going to enter into a little conversation with you guys. So let me pray for us this morning. Thank you, God. Thank you that you look at us with a heart of compassion. We thank you that you never struggle to hear us. Thank you for being constant. You never leave us. You never forsake us. In fact, you never take your eyes off of us. Please wrap us up in your presence this morning, wherever we are, whether we're in this building or in the care center or in our own home or even in the hospital, God, we know you're there. So shine your light on us this morning, scatter the darkness. We just love you. We come under the shelter of your wings. We come into your presence, and we thank you for your love and your authority over our life, God. We position ourselves under your authority this morning, and just thank you for all that you are and all that you always have been and will be. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, like she said, we wanted to have this as a conversation. It's been happening in our home, so we thought it would just be good to be up here and have the same conversation with you in front of you. And so let's start by let's start the conversation by asking the question. I'd like to ask you by a show of hands, by an amen, or if that's too weird for you, you can just raise your left eyebrow an inch <laughs> or a millimeter, okay? How many of you are tired? Amen. Okay, there are a lot of I mean, there's no time. They can't even get their hands up here. They just went right up to the chin, and that was it. Okay, we're tired too. We could, that's why we're sitting here versus standing in front of you. We're, I, I believe everyone I have talked to, and we've talked to a lot of people over the months. Everyone I talk to, that's usually the response. How are you doing? The first thing out of their mouth is they're tired. And then they'll start telling me, like you know, I go through my work day and I come home. And I feel like I need an hour to like just sit down or even take a nap before I can get up and take care of all the evening duties and all the things I need to take my kids to. It's a weird kind of tired that we're experiencing. Or what and so we're gonna talk a little bit today about exactly that. And we came up with a great little word, actually we didn't come up with it, but what we're experiencing is compounding fatigue. Okay, so she said that to me last week. Compounding fatigue. I've never even heard of that word. Maybe you have. But I have never. Had. So can you share with us? We'll put it on the screen table. What is compounding fatigue? Oh, well, it's just exactly what you know that you've been experiencing for months now. You have all your normal ways that you're tired. And then on top of that, you have these additional factors, whether it's what you've seen on the news or what's happening in your own household or what you've heard about your friends dealing with who live in another state. You're tired, but then it's this extreme mental and physical tiredness. It's not just physical, it's not just mental, and it's intensifying every day from what you're feeling or seeing or hearing or even just um, feeling in your own body. So um, we thought it might be 
uh, a walk down memory lane might help explain this even better. So if that's still foggy, uh, we're going to take you through our February to September, just the highlights, and um, see if you can relate to a few of these things. So if y'all can remember back to February of 2020, it seems like it was eight years ago. Um, for us, I had a major surgery in February of 2020. But things were, we were glad. We're like, hey, we need to get this done. Things are looking up. We're looking forward to what's next. And in March, uh, things were kind of clicking along. And we were looking at spring break and excited to get to go on a little break. And then everything started to change. I don't know if you guys remember, we started hearing all these deaths in Italy and all these deaths in New York. And what was going on is this new thing, coronavirus, COVID-19. Um, and so we came out of spring break, and all of a sudden, no kids are going back to school. Right? But we think it's only just for a couple of weeks while we get this thing, you know, figured out or figure out what we're supposed to do. But then it wasn't a couple of weeks. Um, and then all of a sudden, we went to, this, to the grocery store, and we barely get in. There was no food, and no toilet paper, and no anything. And it was madness. And we've never experienced that, most of us, in our lifetime here in America, even though it's like that in other places sometimes. Um, and then on a more serious note, other serious things started happening in our lives. Like our last, my last remaining grandparent who was in assisted living, uh, got complications from a respiratory illness in March. This is still what we were um, saying. And she passed away. And by that time, there were no more funerals. We could just had a great side, um, and we weren't supposed to have a meal afterwards. So things began to get a little more serious feeling. And then all we did was we got some phone calls with the funeral directors, and all of a sudden we were looking at Easter service, and there wasn't going to be able to be one. Nobody in the building. How do you do an Easter service uh, online? And Chris starts scrambling about how to handle all of those things. And all of a sudden, I felt Chris, I had a barter with my neighbor for Clorox wipes and for bread. And I mean, it really felt like, where, what is going on? Can any of you guys relate to some of this? I don't know if you can even remember back that far. Um, I remember I had a niece and nephew that have a birthday in April, and all of the stores were closed. So we went and bought all their favorite things from Pakistan and Walmart, and drove by their house and dropped it off in the yard. You know, drop my birthdays, the new thing that we've all probably now experienced by now. Um, and then for you guys that were in high school or are in high school, and you know, you had seniors in your life, and no graduation, and no prom, and we just started losing, we were experiencing these things. They're small losses, right? We all know it's not the end of the world. We're going to make it through these kind of losses, but they were compounding. It was just one after another after another. And by June, even though it's summer break, it still wasn't normal. It wasn't normal for any of us. For my mom, I remember calling her on Mother's Day in May. Even. It's her first Mother's Day without her mother. And we were all separate. And some of you have experienced the same thing. Maybe you even lost a loved one that you weren't allowed to be with them. Or you have a loved one in the nursing home. And you weren't allowed to go be with them. It, it is... It was a very strange, and is a very strange and difficult time. So when you hear this list, my guess is you're thinking, I have that. We did that. I know about that. I experienced that. These are the intensifying factors of compounding fatigue. Because while all this is going on, we're still just doing normal life, right? Remote schooling for seven weeks. With all your crazy kids. I had a high school kid, a junior high kid, an elementary age kid. I mean, and for some of you, your work never stops. It even intensified in the medical field um, and in all of the education system. So I don't know how you feel listening to that because I've lived through it, and then she's leaving out a lot of stuff just for the sake of time. Is that overwhelming to hear? Are you thinking through your own journey for the past six, seven months? It's, I mean, that's just exhausting to listen to. And Brooke told me something else last week that I'd never heard of either. You can fill a room with all the things I've never heard of. <laughs> so come back and see that, but I've never heard of that. But then she told me there was two kinds of tired. And I had never even 
thought of that, or, or considered that. Two kinds of tired. So I don't want to steal that. I want you to share with them what you share with me about the two kinds of tired. Well, probably like you, as a mom, I'm at home, like, Googling all sorts of things. How to help your kids if they're feeling stressed, heading back to school. What do we do if we're all exhausted, but we couldn't go on vacation? Our schedule is clear. We have, we have more time on our hands than we ever had, but we're still tired. And I would say that that really made me start thinking, like, what if all of our busyness is not what's really making us tired? What if we're tired on the inside? What if we're tired because we have a lack of peace that is just kind of getting uncovered now that we realize we slowed down and we still don't feel at ease? We still don't feel at rest. And so, as she's describing that, I've watched TED Talks about how to get more REM sleep because, of course, that's what you need to be able to feel rested when you wake up. There's stuff over the counter like, I don't know, melatonin or other things you could buy to fix the tiredness that requires rest. But you cannot find anything at the pharmacy and you cannot find a TED Talk to talk about how to get the, the tiredness, how to improve or get rest from the tiredness that requires peace. And even when you, and you share a scripture verse with me in 2 Corinthians that, well, he just paints a picture, Paul paints a perfect picture of these two kinds of tiredness side by side. You want to share it with everyone? Well, yeah, and I would say this. I don't know if all of you are like me, but you realize, like, during this, all of our experts are gone, right? All the people we used to go to, like, with the solid answers for how to deal with this crisis or that, we weren't getting a real solid voice anywhere. And I thought to myself, oh, we, as Americans, we love experts. And when our experts are not there, or somebody has not already walked the road ahead of us, you can kind of tell us, well, this is what I did. We get really uneasy. And so for me, this summer when Chris asked me to do devotion, I did the same thing then as I did now when we were looking at this. And I was like, what did Jesus do? Can I think of a time in scripture I saw Jesus overwhelmed? That was the devotion in summer. Can I think of a time I saw Jesus or one of the apostles or some great man of faith that's written about in the Bible, a great woman of faith, uh, tired? And what were they experiencing? Can I relate to it at all? And um, what I found was this great scripture in 2 Corinthians, and it's Paul talking. And we know Paul. My goodness, the things that he did. Of course, he was physically tired. All right? So let me explain uh, or read to you in 2 Corinthians 7. I'm going to just start in verse 5. Um, Paul's been talking to the Corinthian church, writing actually, and he says this Even after we came into the province of Macedonia, we found no relief. We were restless and exhausted. Troubles met us at every turn. Outwardly, we faced conflict, and inwardly, emotional strife. Let me just say to all you teachers who've been here doing remote learning and in class learning, and all your little children have masks, and they just want to hug, and you're not sure if you should hug them because your mom is going to visit you that weekend. Can you relate? Do you feel sometimes you have no rest? Can you think? Do you feel, man, I'm kind of harassed at every turn with every uh, detail I'm supposed to change every week? Um, do you have conflicts on the outside, but then fears within as you're dealing with those conflicts on the outside? I talked to a bunch of teachers last Sunday, and I, my heart just went out to every one of them as I was just listening to these really amazing, I mean, these teachers who love children, and they're saying, I just wonder, for the first time in my life, I'm grabbing a little kindergartner's hand and thinking, is this the last thing to do? <laughs> you know? And that is something that we have to deal with. Do we preserve our own personal, you know, health at the expense of another? What is being called for in this moment? Because we all know sometimes in that moment, God might ask you or nudge you to do something. Um, one way or the other, according to what he wants and what he knows. Um, so we're in good company. When we feel like we have fears within and conflict without, we're in good company. Paul is there, Jesus is even there. Guys. So that's the part we want to get into now. We've got the problem firmly established, all right? Came into this room feeling fatigued. You're probably more fatigued now just after thinking about your own life and details. 
I set aside in Bible when you talk to women, they say you're tired. When I talk to men, you're not allowed to say you're tired as a man. They say busy. That's the word they'll say. It's okay to say that. It's not okay to be tired as a guy. I just translate that into if they're busy, they're tired. Because they're dealing with all this as well. And you shared something from John chapter 4 uh, that to me was so encouraging. One of the most encouraging pieces of scripture I've ever seen regarding this very thing, compounding fatigue. And, I mean, I could have stole this sermon and just taken it right out of your mouth, but I really want you to hear from her because she was relaying this to me. Well, it was filling to me, just instantaneous. And so, if you know what weariness feels like, not just the outer tiredness, but I mean the inside stuff, the compound, if you know what that feels like, I want you to hear this passage from John chapter 4. This was so ministering to me, and I, I, I believe it will be very ministering to you. So, for those of you, I mean, you know John chapter 4, we usually think of Samaria and the woman at the well. And so we kind of know how that's of that scripture. But I believe when sometimes when we're diving into scripture and we're saying, Jesus, I need to really hear something specific from you, something that catch your eyes that you literally never noticed until you were in a certain struggle. And that's what happened in this passage uh, with us. So John 4, starting in verse 4. Now Jesus had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about me. So, Jesus got tired too. Right? What do we know about Jesus? He was sinless. He even says in his word, I only do what the Father tells me. What the Father says and tells me to do, that's what I do. So can you be doing God's will and still get tired? You can even be doing his perfect will, right? Like Jesus does, because we don't do that. But you could be doing God's perfect will and still get that. You could be sinless if you were Jesus and still get that. That's not us. But still, he still got that. That is, to me, that's so powerful. And it doesn't say he was on a long and treacherous journey. It says he was on a long journey, walking to another destination. And he got tired. So it's possible that we're all on this journey. We know God, God is right. He's sovereign. He's in control. But we're still tired. We're still fatigued. So for me, the one of the reasons that was so huge is because I've always equated tiredness with weakness. How many of your dads have trained you like that? Or grandparents or parents? Like you're not allowed to be tired. You're not allowed to show tired. You're not allowed to sweat. I mean, you work and you grind it out and you persevere and you don't let anyone see you take a big breath. Go, go, go at all costs. So if you feel tired on the inside or on the outside, it's a character flaw. That at least, I don't know that anyone has ever said that to me, but the culture I was raised in, that's the value that came forth. I mean, we live in a country that was birthed and built by some work or a lot of work. It was by a lot of hard work. I mean, that's one of the core values of our country. So every person's home I've ever known and listened to them talk, they pretty much were taught the same thing I was. He said, either directly or indirectly, tiredness is weakness. So when, I, when she showed me John chapter 4, I had read that probably 200 times. I had never seen or stopped on the fact that Jesus got tired. I never saw that before. Never registered to me. I just went right by. And there's a quote you told me too uh, that has to do with this that I thought also was a really way to pull all this into one quote. Faith does not prevent fatigue. Uh, that's clear in scripture. But what do we do when we are fatigued? Um, and there is a, a lot that you have to say about that too. But I just love to be strong and tired. To be weary, um, but not completely weak. And there's something about the fact that Jesus was tired and he sat down. But I was telling Chris, I get tired. 
but I just clean the baseboards. You know, I just go into my top of the drive or something. Because the more tired I get, I feel like I need to get more done because I feel like I haven't got enough done. And it's amazing to know that Jesus, um, fully God and fully man, sat down and had some conversation like we're doing right now. Because um, faith doesn't prevent fatigue. And that's something I fought like for my whole since I've been a Christian. If, if, if I felt weary, then something was wrong with my faith. I, just, I wasn't trusting enough, or I wasn't seeking God enough. That if I did those things enough, I wouldn't feel weary. So my weariness is actually my fault. That's how I fought for a long, long time. And the, and the truth in John chapter four and the second Corinthians. Seven verses that Brooke read. That is not true at all. The Bible actually teaches something very different than that. And that wasn't imposed by on me by anyone above me or next to me. That's just my own flawed thinking that if I was weary, something was wrong with me. I wasn't doing something enough. And that is not true. If the one who created all things, the world was created by him, for him, and through him, if that being person got tired seems pretty normal for me and you, all of us, to get tired too, right? To me, that is so liberating to hear that Jesus got tired. Yeah, and I, I do believe he was talking about those times of healing. Because this wasn't the time of scripture, Jesus was the most physically tired. And I don't know if y'all noticed, but even when Jesus is addressing the disciples through scripture, um, and something's going wrong, and I thought about this when I was uh, going over this, I'm reading it again this morning. When the wind and waves are swelling, and Jesus is asleep, and all the disciples are upset, um, does he ever say, like Peter, Peter was the buck guy, right? does he look at Peter and go, you should have worked out more? Didn't you know to put the sails down and get the anchor up? Shouldn't you have been stronger? You should have been looking more weights, Peter. He never, he never acknowledged or called them or addressed what was going on on their physical strength. He always called them to the inside um, about their belief or unbelief or their fear, mostly their fear. So um, he never talked to them about their physical strength being their problem. Um, so I thought that was very interesting. And another thing that we were thinking about together, I was like, can you think of a time that you know somebody can be really strong? I would think of one of your children when they were overly tired, past tired, compounded fatigue, and you tried to put them in a car seat and found out that they had superhuman strength. <laughs> right? You like had to wrestle your child into the oven to get them into the car seat and get that thing snapped. Right? We know that we can, when we're overly tired, maybe even fight harder to rest. Um, it's in our nature, right? From the time we're tiny, we fight when we're tired. We fight against the one thing that can give us rest on the inside or on the outside. Jesus promised. Come to me, all of you who are weary, and I will give you rest. And I'm sure you've probably heard that, right? It's a promise. If you can't admit you're weary, you're not going to get the rest. I mean, part of that promise is being able to identify and admit, I'm weary. So as we close this morning, a couple things for me. There's, there's one thing I want you to do, and there's one thing I want you to one thing I want you to do is I want you to take time, and I don't just mean the mamas, but feel free. I want you to take time and write out the details of your life, your events from March or February until now, like, like Brooke did, like we did and talked about. And I mean everything. What, what Brooke didn't mention is we started this year, like she had one surgery to fix a problem. It went fast. So we had to have, she had to have a second surgery to repair the first one. There's a lot of fear in the middle of that. Brooke's been on quarantine since February. The world started to shut down in March, but she got a month head start just trying to recover from a surgery that wasn't supposed to have to happen. The only reason that happened is because the first one went bad. So I'd forgotten all about that. I mean, like what it says, a few years ago, it feels like. So when you take some time to write down your life, 
over the past six or seven months. And the reason I want you to do that is because I want you to give yourself permission to say, I'm tired. I'm exhausted. It's not a character flaw. It's not a weakness. There's nothing wrong with me. Look at this list. Anyone in their right mind would be exhausted by this. You have the same story we have, just different ingredients. Please take time to do that. That's what, I love, that's what I would love for you to do this week. And the thing I want to leave with you knowing is that faith does not prevent fatigue. It doesn't matter how many Bible studies you go to, how many worship songs you have on your radio. At the end of the day, maybe at the end of the morning, you may feel like you can barely take another breath. And that's okay. It's not your fault. And I would also, I just want to talk to the young people that I put to. Because I mean, I think it's time for you guys. I mean, I've been praying for you guys for months. But you guys, the younger people, I was uh, wishing you could talk on just you guys. Because we've said to y'all, be flexible, be flexible, wait and see, be flexible. And you know what, you guys have never been able to talk about. I've seen my child with sensory problems to the mask on every day and march to school like it's his favorite thing to do. And I think sometimes uh, we need to give you guys a moment and just love on you, give you grace, also tell you you're amazed by your courage, how you just played football and you got ready for all the things that have to do with your senior year, that's up in the air, you don't care, you just take the next day, go and smile and, you know, enjoy the things you can. It's huge. The things you're learning now will serve you so well in life, in the future. And there's a scripture just for you guys that says that even you grow tired and get weary, right? But if you can admit that to God at least, he says that um, if you will hope in him, he'll renew your strength. Not just someday away in the future, every day. Every day. And so we're going to do one last hymn all together. And I don't often think of a song kind of how to close the service, but I actually was thinking of this song, just like you were this week. It was in my head when we were discussing and praying through this sermon because of the words. So even though it's a really familiar song, I would love if you guys would really, even if you're not singing, just read these words and think about your life um, in Jesus' faithfulness.